I never imagined I'd face a future without Linda. It seemed impossible, completely out of character for her. Linda and I had been together since our college years, growing from young, hopeful sweethearts into parents raising two fantastic kids. We had weathered plenty of challenges, celebrated all kinds of victories, and built a life we thought was unbreakable over two decades. It's astonishing how quickly everything can fall to pieces, even when you believe it's rock solid. Just a few weeks ago, everything seemed normal. We were planning a family trip, catching up on the kids' progress in college, and managing our hectic schedules. Sure, I'd been drowning in work, especially with a big case taking up most of my energy, but Linda had always been understanding of the demands. That's why, when I walked through the door one afternoon and found her note, it felt like a sledgehammer to my chest. The message was painfully brief. Mark, I need time away. I'm not sure how long. None of this is your fault. I've met someone. Please don't try to contact me. I have to do this. With love, Linda. Just like that, my wife of 21 years was gone, disappearing as if our life together had been a mirage. I'm Mark Hansen, and my wife is Linda, though I've always called her Lynn. We'd known each other since we were kids, thanks to our family's close ties. But it wasn't until college that we became more than just friends. We'd gone to different schools growing up but reconnected in college, and by our senior year, we were practically inseparable. We got married that summer after graduation. Linda is a bright, energetic woman with blue eyes and light brown hair. And I'm average height with brown hair and hazel eyes. I run my own legal practice, and Lynn works as a senior nurse in a hospital a few towns over. We're both 42 and stay fit with a mix of gym workouts, hiking, and tennis. Linda is a devoted fan of dance classes, while I hit the boxing bag a few times a week. We have two kids in college, Tom, who's 19, and Lily, who's 18 and a freshman. The day I read her note, a crisp April afternoon, I immediately called Tom. I told him the news straight out. Tom, your mom left. She's, she's gone, I said struggling to keep my voice steady. There was a long pause. What? Dad, what do you mean, gone? She left me a note, I said, trying to make sense of it myself. She left. Tom went silent, absorbing the shock. I, I don't believe it, he finally said, stunned. I'll keep you posted, son, I told him, attempting to stay composed. Then I called Lily. Unlike Tom, she wasn't as shocked. Did you know this was coming? I asked. She hesitated before answering. Not exactly, but I saw her with someone a few times. A guy from work. His name is Andrew Connors. Did you think it was more than friendship? I asked, pressing for details. Lily sighed. Honestly, I didn't think too much about it, Dad. She seemed uncomfortable when I asked her, but I didn't push. I'm sorry. I should have said something. This isn't your fault, honey, I said, trying to reassure her even as my thoughts swirled. After those calls, I searched online for this, Andrew Connors. He was a doctor who'd recently resigned from Linda's hospital. His profile described him as 41, divorced, a cardiologist who had shifted into hospital management. There was even a report about a surgery gone wrong three years back, where he'd been part of a malpractice case. He's tall, built solidly, with dark hair. But when I tried to find his new address or employment, I got nothing. So, I reached out to my old friend Dave, who's skilled in tech. Dave, I need your help, I said. What's up, Mark? He asked, his voice concerned. Linda's gone. I think she left with someone named Andrew Connors. Can you help me find them? I explained. All right, he replied. Let me see what I can dig up. Later that night, I checked our bank accounts. Linda hadn't touched her checking account, but her latest paycheck wasn't there and she cleaned out nearly all of our joint savings, around $190,000, transferring it out just days earlier. I called Dave again and gave him our account information, hoping he could trace the transaction. I'll look into it and keep you posted, he assured me. The next day, I drove out to Linda's parents, Paul and Martha Bradley, who live about 25 miles away. When I got there, both of their cars were in the driveway. Paul answered the door and led me into the kitchen where Martha was sitting with a mug in her hand. Hi, Martha. I greeted her, sitting across from them. What's going on? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Paul was the first to speak, 
sounding a bit weary. Mark, we've known Linda's been struggling with some things, he admitted. She confided a lot in Martha. Martha looked at me with a mix of pity and sadness. I never wanted to keep anything from you, Mark, she said. But she begged us not to say anything until she was ready to talk to you herself. Ready? She just took off with no warning. And she drained our savings, too. Maybe I should have her arrested if she doesn't bring back at least half, I muttered, anger boiling over. Don't talk like that, Martha said softly. Paul quickly added, Linda believes this guy is her new future. I looked at him in disbelief. Are you serious? You think this guy is her future? Because right now, I think he's just a con. Martha sighed. We met him once, a few weeks ago. She introduced him as a friend from work, but it was clear there was more to it. And you didn't think to warn me? I asked, my voice rising. We thought she'd talk to you on her own. Come to her senses, Paul replied, shaking his head. Just then, my phone buzzed. It was Dave. Mark, I found them. Linda and Connors took jobs at a hospital in Chicago. They're renting an apartment near there and have a joint bank account now, but the big money hasn't shown up yet. It's possible they transferred it out of the country. Can you track it if it's offshore? I asked. I can try, but it'll take time and cost a bit more, Dave warned. Let me know what you find, I said. Hanging up, I turned back to Martha and Paul, who had been watching me. If she wants to come back, will you take her back? Martha asked, her voice trembling. I shook my head in disbelief. Why would you even think she'd want to come back? She's left everything behind. Martha's eyes filled with tears. I just believe, somehow, she'll regret this and want to make things right. If she does, maybe you could consider counseling? But the longer she stays with him, living like his wife. Well, you know how it is, I muttered, glancing back at Martha. She started sobbing and Paul put an arm around her to comfort her. I thanked them for their time, left, and headed back to my office. Just as I was stepping inside, my phone rang. It was Dave again. Mark, there's been a delay on the $190,000 transfer, he said. Apparently, Vanguard flagged it for potential fraud. They're refusing to release the money for now, even though the account is joint. There's something unusual about how the withdrawal was processed. I filled him in on my earlier conversation with Vanguard, where I'd argued that the withdrawal was illegal. They had mentioned that some inconsistencies had triggered the block. I quickly had one of my colleagues file a temporary restraining order, TRO, against Vanguard, as well as against Linda and Connors. My colleague spent the better part of an hour on it, and then I submitted it electronically. At least that would hold off the transfer, giving me some breathing room to figure things out. I needed to let my family know what was going on. So I called my parents in Oregon, who've been retired for years. They were shocked and deeply sympathetic. After I hung up, I sat there, thinking about what I could do next, and more importantly, what I wanted to do. I looked up some information and learned that while infidelity isn't illegal in Illinois, it's technically a misdemeanor in Virginia. I made a mental note, wondering if that might be relevant down the line. In the midst of this mess, I did what I always did when life threw a punch. I called my Uncle Jed. He's my mom's older brother, a retired lawyer who's become a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. But to me, Jed is more than that. He's a guide, someone who's always had a knack for cutting through life's noise. I asked if I could swing by his place, and he agreed, suggesting we have some pizza and beer for dinner. While I waited for evening to roll around, I contacted a private investigator I knew. I asked him to dig into Linda's history with Connors trying to gauge just how long this affair might have been going on. Had I missed some signs? Had there been hints that I'd ignored? I remembered the intensity of the four-month trial I just wrapped up. It had consumed me, both in preparation and in court. Sure, we won. But maybe in those six months of non-stop focus, I'd overlooked something in my own home. Up until a month ago, Linda and I had still been intimate, which made it harder to believe something was amiss. But then, without warning, she pulled back, and I was too preoccupied to see it for what it was. After the trial, I'd settled back into my usual routine, thinking things would naturally return to normal. How wrong I was. On my way to Jed's, I stopped by a clinic and took a set of precautionary tests. Then, I picked up the pizza and beer, trying to steady myself for the evening. 
When I arrived, Jed welcomed me at the door, his house looking just as I remembered from my childhood. He'd been married to Aunt Ellen for 40 years, but she passed away from pneumonia five years ago. Since then, he'd had a couple of short relationships, but none had lasted. Tonight, it was just the two of us. What brings such a busy lawyer all the way out here? He asked, smiling but with a hint of concern. I laid it all out for him, showed him the note, described everything I'd done since finding out. He looked thoughtful then said, This doesn't sound like the Linda I know. He got up, saying, Sit here for a minute, Mark, and think about your life with her. All of it. I'll grab us some drinks. I did as he suggested, my mind turning over every memory. We built a good life, Linda and I. We laughed, cried, raised our kids, shared everything together. As I sat there, memories of our life flooded in, and for the first time, I let the pain wash over me. I started crying, silently, feeling the depth of loss that seemed almost too big to grasp. Jed returned with two glasses and a bottle of whiskey, his expression a mix of compassion and understanding. I poured us each a drink, and he knocked his back, nodding for me to do the same. I followed suit, grateful for the warm distraction. You're one of the smartest people I know, he said, his voice steady. Now tell me, do you really want her back? I sat quietly, wrestling with my answer. I want my old life back, but that feels impossible now. And if she came back, how could I trust she wouldn't do this again? I don't know if I can survive that. Jed leaned back, taking it in. You need time to process this. There's only so much I can do to help. The rest you'll need someone else for. This talk is just a start, he added. I'm not exactly the best role model. I've been alone since Ellen. I half smiled and replied. Still out there dating? Yeah, he chuckled. But it doesn't replace having everything. We ended up talking for hours, sharing stories about our marriages. I saw tears in his eyes too, remembering Aunt Ellen, and I felt a strange mix of anger and sadness rising in me. The conversation left me with a surge of intense anger, a kind I'd rarely felt. I stood up, suddenly needing to get outside. I stumbled out to Jed's backyard, where he still had an old heavy bag hanging from a tree. I started pounding and kicking Jed's old heavy bag, releasing a wave of anger that felt like it could tear me apart. My fury was all directed at Linda, and I pictured her standing there as I punched and kicked. You heartless, selfish liar. I screamed. Jed watched from the porch, later telling me he almost called an ambulance when he saw the rage that had overtaken me. Just as he was reaching for the phone, I lashed out and kicked the pear tree, sending one of its fruits flying over the fence into the neighbor's yard. Finally, exhausted, I collapsed onto the ground, sobbing. Jed rushed over, helped me inside, and did his best to calm me down. I felt like a total wreck, my muscles completely drained and aching. Eventually, Jed settled me onto his couch and covered me with a blanket, letting me drift off into a restless sleep. The next morning, I woke to the smell of coffee and bacon. I managed to roll off the couch, still a bit unsteady but driven by hunger. We sat down to a breakfast of eggs, bacon, and toast. Afterward, I took a shower, borrowing some fresh clothes from Jed. I bandaged my sore, swollen hands, something Linda had taught me to do years ago, back when she'd started as a nurse. My whole body ached, and I had a small cut above my right eye. I patched it up with a butterfly bandage, realizing I looked like I'd been in a fist fight. Jed handed me a card with the contact information of a counselor he'd seen once, a woman named Mary Stevens. He thought talking to someone could help, even if I went alone. I pocketed the card, drove home, changed into a suit, and headed into the office. I must have looked rough because the moment I walked in, my staff's eyebrows shot up. I gathered everyone for a quick meeting and told them what had happened. I explained that I'd be in and out for a while until things were resolved and reassigned my upcoming cases. Despite everything, I somehow managed to focus and get a bit of work done. By 5.30, I was back home, where Linda's belongings still filled the place. She'd taken some clothes and personal items, but had left most of her things behind. Determined to reclaim my space, I drove to the store, bought boxes and tape, and started packing up every last one of her belongings. Clothes, books, photo albums, shoes, everything. 
I stored it all in the garage, where her car had once been parked. Then I went through the house, gathering up every photo of her from every room. I tossed them all, frames and albums included. That evening, after throwing together a quick microwave dinner, I went to bed, my mind racing with everything that had happened. Just as I was about to drift off, I remembered her phone, still plugged into the charger, along with our shared computer. I checked her email but found nothing helpful. Her phone's call log, however, showed repeated calls to a Virginia number for about six weeks, right up until she left. The texts to Billy, Andrew Connors, were mostly about meeting up before work and arranging lunches. Nothing overtly incriminating, but it was clear they'd been meeting for a while. The next day, work distracted me, much to my surprise. After lunch, my private investigator called with an update. He'd spent the morning at a cafe where some of Linda's colleagues often ate, and her sudden departure with Connors had become a hot topic. Apparently, rumors about them had been circulating for weeks, and a few staff members had even seen them kissing outside a restaurant and leaving a nearby motel together. Linda had rented a room there a few times in recent weeks, always paying in cash. Twice, it had been her car parked there. Once, it was someone else's. Wondering why Connors wasn't covering his share of these expenses, I asked Dave to dig into his finances. A couple of hours later, he found that Connors had been dealing with heavy financial issues for months, strapped with mortgage and credit card debt and barely scraping by after his divorce. Wages were being garnished, and he wasn't paying child support. Suddenly, it was clear why he might have been drawn to the $190,000 Linda had taken. My sympathy for her was short-lived, and I ended up punching an office chair in frustration, sending it skidding across the room. After calming down, I called Mary Stevens and set up an appointment. Then I walked down the hall to see Mildred Hoover, one of the top divorce attorneys around. She took me to her office immediately. After explaining the situation, she went over what I could expect in the divorce. The prenup meant my firm was protected, but Linda would still be entitled to half the house and any marital assets. Mildred assured me that the temporary restraining order hearing was set for Monday and that Linda had been served at her job in Pittsburgh. My firm could handle the TRO, but I needed Mildred's expertise for the divorce. That night, sitting alone in the quiet house, I started to feel the weight of it all sink in. I had a microwave pizza for dinner, then went for a long run. Around 9.30, I decided to call Lily. She answered, sounding a bit rushed, like she'd almost let it go to voicemail. Hi, Dad. What's up? She said. Just checking in, honey. I wanted to know if you'd heard from your mom. Well, I have, but she asked me not to say much, she replied, hesitating. She says you're trying to get her and Connors in trouble. She's supposed to be in court, or at least have a lawyer, on Monday. She's really upset. What's happening, Dad? Money, mostly. Someone tried to pull a big amount out of our joint account, and I filed to stop it until we can talk things through. I'm not even sure if your mom knows what's really going on, I said, trying to keep it simple. Is she safe with this guy? Lily sounded worried. I think so, but I'm not really sure. I did hear some shouting in the background, a man's voice. He sounded angry, but she told me it was nothing. I hope she's right. Well, it's out of my hands right now, I said, forcing a calm tone. We talked a bit about her classes and a new friend she'd made, then said our goodbyes. My weekend passed quickly, and Monday arrived. I had the TRO hearing in the morning and my first counseling session in the afternoon. I'd spoken to Tom, who hadn't heard from his mother at all, and went to the gym later to blow off some steam. While I was there, I ran into Linda's close friend, Clara Barton. She saw me first and tried to slip out the back, but I caught up to her before she could leave. I don't want to talk, Mark. It won't change anything, she said, looking annoyed. So you knew she was cheating, Clara? Why didn't you tell me? I asked, trying to keep my anger in check. She said you'd take it badly. Maybe even do something cruel. I'm her friend, Mark, and I didn't know if she was being fair about that, she said, meeting my eyes. And Connors? Isn't he trouble? That's the impression I'm getting, I replied. Yes, he is trouble. I warned her about him. But she wouldn't listen, Clara said. She thought she was in love, believed he was her future. Yeah, her mother told me the same. I wish she'd just talked to me before sneaking off, I said, shaking my head. 
Clara sighed. I don't think this will last, and she'll come back sooner or later. Maybe this whole thing will blow over. It's too late, Clara. She's made her choice, I said firmly. She shrugged and headed back to her treadmill, giving me a faint smile. She looked good in her fitted workout clothes, and I couldn't help but notice. She caught my look in the mirror and smiled back. Smirking, she picked up the pace on the treadmill, emphasizing her curves. I gave her a playful wink and left, feeling unexpectedly lighter after our talk. That conversation with Clara lifted my spirits. It had been a long time since I'd felt engaged with someone, especially after everything that had happened with Linda. Feeling a little less burdened, I walked over to the leg press machine and set the weight high, pushing through three sets of 12 reps when I added more weight. I noticed Clara had left the treadmill and was heading in my direction. She stopped near me, watching as I finished my set. I dropped the weight, breathing heavily, and looked up at her. She glanced down and gave me a mischievous smile. I feel bad about all that's happened, she said, but if you're up for a distraction, want to come shower at my place across the street? Deal. Let me grab my things, I replied. No need. You can come back for them later, she said, grinning and motioning for me to follow. Clara was in her early thirties, average height, with a curvy, athletic build. She'd been married once, but was now divorced. She was definitely the perfect distraction. I followed her across the street to a nearby apartment building, and we headed up to the second floor. As we walked, she swayed slightly, giving me a playful smile. Inside her apartment, she turned and pulled me close, lifting her face to mine. I kissed her deeply, and she let out a soft sigh. I've wanted you for a while, she whispered. We moved toward her bedroom, each of us shedding layers. She tossed her sports bra aside revealing a figure that was toned and curvy in all the right places. I didn't think about anything else for the next while as we fell into bed together. She pulled me close, whispering, Take me strong, Mark. Long and strong. Afterward, as we lay there catching our breath, she turned to me with a smile. How soon can you go again? She asked playfully. It turned out the answer was, remarkably, not very long at all. I was ready, and round two began. This time, Clara took the lead, and I didn't mind one bit. We climaxed together, and she collapsed on top of me. Afterward, I must have passed out because she had to wake me later. Go grab your things and come back. You can shower here, she said. It was already dark out, so I quickly got dressed, ran to collect my stuff, and packed it up fast. On my way out, one of the women who'd been there earlier smiled and said, Have a good time? Oh yeah, thanks for asking, I replied with a grin. When I got back to Clara's, she'd already showered. I took a quick one myself and put on a pair of gym shorts from my bag. Didn't see the need for anything more. Clara, meanwhile, had slipped into a Terry robe, which I had a feeling I'd be helping her out of later. We'll need some food and drinks, she said, pulling out two bottles of light ale from the fridge and a frozen pizza. She popped the pizza into the oven and set the timer. We cracked open the beers, and Clara asked. So. Were you serious about not taking Linda back? I might have been a bit hasty when I said that, I admitted. But now, with you here, maybe it does feel more final. Well, if she stepped out, now you have too, she replied, taking a sip of her beer. Might be all the reason you need to move on. But honestly, why does everyone think she'd want to come back? She left knowing what she was giving up. If she realizes she made a mistake, it'll be hard for her to admit it. She might feel too ashamed to even ask. I don't think I could forgive her, Clara, I said, shaking my head. It's been going on a while, and I don't see myself ever being okay with that. Clara nodded. Well, whatever happens, you know where to find me. I promise I'll keep driving you crazy, she teased with a wink. We finished our beers just as the oven timer went off. Clara served up the pizza, and we ate quickly, washing it down with another round of beers. Later that night, we found our way back to each other, and it was incredible. I was realizing just how much I was beginning to fall for her. In the morning, I woke up next to Clara, both of us still unclothed. She stirred as I moved and went to brush her teeth, tossing me a spare toothbrush as she walked by. We took a shower together, and it turned into one of the most intense experiences I'd ever had. I pressed her against the wall, and we made love standing up, completely lost in the moment. Afterward, we cooked a big breakfast, 
still unclothed, because why bother getting dressed? After breakfast, we lounged on her sofa, talking and relaxing, and soon found ourselves in each other's arms again. She laughed afterward and said, I'm not sure what to do with all this, Mark. I've always had a thing for you, and yesterday, when I saw my chance, I just jumped on it. I chuckled, nodding. Yeah, like a tigress, I replied, still catching my breath. I never imagined anything like this. It's unbelievable. She smiled, studying me. I mean, we just finished, and here I am, wanting you again already. It's wild, she laughed. But I know you might need a little recovery time. We both laughed, curious about how long it might actually take. Ten minutes? Twenty? But then she glanced down at me, noticing I was ready again. You're like a machine, she said with a grin. How about we talk after this next round? Twenty minutes later, she got up and headed to the bathroom. We should probably get dressed. Otherwise, we might die of exhaustion. Or worse, she joked. Fine, but only for a little while, I replied. I threw on a fresh pair of gym shorts and a t-shirt while she slipped into a dress. But I couldn't stop thinking about what was underneath, and she could tell. Wow, what's going on here? Clara asked, looking at me seriously. I mean, it seems like we're both just, I don't know, totally wrapped up in this. I think we might be the most physically compatible people in the world. I replied honestly. I'd never experienced anything quite like this before. It felt like we were in uncharted territory. Clara smiled but nodded thoughtfully. There's only one way to find out if this is real. How about heading back to your place so you can change and check your emails? She laughed, adding, And if we keep a little distance in the car, we might even make it there in one piece. We laughed so hard at the thought that we ended up doubled over, but eventually, we managed to get dressed and head to my house. Clara had never been inside before. So she looked around while I got changed and managed to catch up on some work. Since it was Sunday, I put on the baseball game, and as it turned out, Clara was a big fan too. We watched for nearly an hour before I felt that familiar pull toward her. I took her hand, and we made our way upstairs to the master bedroom, neither of us needing to say a word. I made love to Clara slowly, taking our time, and we reached another incredible, mutual climax, something that rarely ever happened with Linda. When it was over, Clara looked at me with tears in her eyes and whispered, Joe, I've fallen in love with you. I just want to thank you for everything. She was crying, and I found myself tearing up too. We sat quietly for a while, drying our eyes and I finally said, I wonder how the game's going. We went back downstairs to catch the last two innings. Clara was completely engaged, calling out plays, guessing when a player might try to steal a base or pull a hit and run. Her enthusiasm for the game matched mine, and it made me feel even closer to her. Later, I made us a meal, roasted chicken. We ate, drank some wine, and shared quiet, tender moments, exchanging little touches and glances. Looking into her eyes, I realized I wanted Clara by my side for the long run. She held my hand and said, I'm in love with you, Joe, and I'll fight to keep it. I gave her hand a squeeze and replied, You don't have to fight. I'm all yours. We went back upstairs for another round, savoring each moment. We stayed together late into the night, even into the morning. During breakfast, I told her, I've got court in therapy today. Honestly, I might not even need therapy as much now, but I'll still go. And if you're here when I get back, I'll cook dinner for us again. Clara laughed. Oh, I'll be here, she replied with a grin. I'd say I'll be fully dressed but it's more likely I'll be waiting, unclothed. We laughed together, shared a kiss, and I drove her home. Later that morning, I stood in court with a lawyer from my firm. Shelley and Connors arrived with their attorney, and Vanguard's lawyer was also present. Judge Carlson took his seat, and as the proceedings began, Shelley wouldn't even look at me. Connors cast a quick glance my way, but then avoided eye contact. Vanguard's lawyer explained why the $200,000 transfer had been blocked stating that the request had come from an unrecognized computer at 3 a.m., using an unfamiliar email linked to the account. The firm's system flagged the transaction because the account receiving the funds wasn't in either mine or Shelley's name. Vanguard wanted the TRO upheld to avoid any liability while the issue was sorted out. My lawyer argued that the money was joint property and had been moved without my consent. 
He pointed out that Shelley had left without notice, quit her job, relocated to Pittsburgh, and moved in with Connors. Shelley's lawyer countered, claiming she had as much right to access the funds as I did, and that the money should be transferred according to her intentions. Judge Carlson turned to Vanguard's lawyer and asked, where was the money supposed to go? To a local bank account in the name of William Connors, he replied. Have you identified whose computer was used for the transfer attempt? The judge asked. No, your honor. That's beyond our capabilities at this time. The lawyer responded. The judge looked at Shelley and said, I'd like Mrs. Mason to take the oath. Shelley seemed to shrink, and Connors squeezed her hand before letting go. She raised her right hand and swore to tell the truth. Mrs. Mason, are you married to Joseph Mason? Yes, she replied softly. Do you jointly own an account with him at Vanguard? Yes. Did you attempt to withdraw $200,000 from this account last week? I, I. Shelley glanced around, clearly nervous. Connors stepped away from her. Not exactly, she finally managed to say. Explain, please, the judge instructed. Mr. Connors asked to borrow $220,000 to pay off some debts, she admitted reluctantly. I agreed, but he said my computer wasn't working and asked for my password to use his. I gave it to him, and he used his computer to log in. I didn't know he was attempting to withdraw $200,000. When did you learn about the amount? The judge pressed. When I received a notice, she said quietly. Judge Carlson turned to Connors. Mr. Connors, please state your name and address for the record. Connors resisted, saying, I'm only here to support Michelle. Please comply, the judge said firmly. Connors hesitated, but gave his information, which I already knew. The judge then turned to my lawyer and asked, Is Mr. Mason planning to file for divorce? Yes, your honor, my lawyer replied. The paperwork has been prepared and will be filed this week. The judge ordered Vanguard to freeze the account until family court could review the assets. He instructed my lawyer to file the divorce papers by the end of the next day, or he would reconsider the freeze order. As soon as the hearing ended, I saw Shelley slump into her chair, head in her hands. Connors slipped out of the courtroom without a word, leaving her sitting there, looking utterly defeated. As the courtroom emptied, the bailiff motioned for us to leave so he could lock up. I guided Shelley into the corridor. Connors was nowhere to be seen, and only a few people were in the hall. You came here with that jerk? I asked, looking at her closely. Yes, she murmured, barely able to meet my eyes. Joe, I'm sorry. I thought he was the one. I told my family he was my future. Looks like I was wrong. I feel like a fool. You have no idea how deeply you hurt me by ending a long marriage with a short note. Shelly. I replied. She looked at me, her eyes full of regret. Joe, our marriage isn't over. I see that now, Shelley said, her voice breaking. I was so stupid. I want to come back and be your wife again. Tears streamed down her face, but I shook my head. Sorry, Shelley. It's too late. You've been with him for months, living with him like he was your husband. You left without even talking to me. Now you have to face the consequences. She looked at me pleadingly. Can't we go somewhere more private? What about the kids? She asked desperately. They're hurt and disappointed in you. And you know it. I replied, my tone firm. Do you even have any real reason for throwing me away like that? No. She murmured, almost to herself. If you'd asked me earlier, I'd have told you I thought he was my soulmate. I thought a clean break would be easier for you. But I can't even explain now why I was so foolish. Her crying intensified, and though I hated to see her like that, I knew I couldn't go back. I was done with her as my wife. There's a limit to everything. Yes, I said quietly, and now Clara is my soulmate, or at least, she's the best partner I've ever had. It feels real to me, Shelley. I asked what she planned to do next. I have a job in Pittsburgh, and I'm working a shift tomorrow. I signed a year lease, so I guess I'll kick Connors out and see what happens. Maybe, maybe you'll miss me. Let me know if you do, she said, sounding defeated. I'll probably miss you, but that doesn't mean I'll understand why you did this. I thought we were fine. I didn't see this coming, I told her. She hugged me tightly before leaving, and as soon as she was gone, I felt a wave of sadness come over me. I cried openly, 
but beneath that sadness, there was a knot of anger twisting inside me. I decided I needed help understanding it all, so I kept my therapy appointment that afternoon. After a quick lunch, a hot tuna sandwich from Subway, I headed over to see Mary Stevens, the marriage counselor. She introduced herself as Mary, a warm, gray-haired woman who looked grandmotherly at first but moved with athletic grace and a kind smile. I liked her right away. So, what brings you here, Mr. Mason? She asked. Please, call me Joe, I said, trying to relax. My wife suddenly left me. She left a note, then moved to Pittsburgh with another guy. Before that, she'd been with him for about a month. Mary nodded. And how did you respond? She asked, gently. I told her how overwhelmed I'd felt at first, then shared about my visit to Uncle Jed and how I tried to work off the anger by punching the heavy back. At first, I was heartbroken. Then I got angry. Now, I feel like both emotions are hitting me at once. You've gone through a lot of stages quickly, Mary said thoughtfully. Grief, sadness, anger. These feelings can alternate and cycle through for quite a while. How are you feeling now? Honestly, I'm still confused, I replied. I was at the gym one day, lifting weights to work off my anger, and ran into a nurse I knew through Shelly, Clara Barton. I confronted her, and eventually, she told me about Shelly and Connors. Then, well, Clara and I ended up spending the night together. It was unexpected. Mary looked surprised but then gave a small, knowing smile. You're clearly attracted to Clara, she said, and she's likely interested in you, but you might be in a vulnerable place right now. It's complicated, I know, but something about it feels incredibly real, I said, almost to myself. Mary studied me for a moment. You've been through a lot, Joe, and this new relationship might feel like a safe escape. I'm not doubting your feelings for Clara, but I do want you to give it time. Try to learn more about her, talk, and see if it's real. I think we'll have time for that, I said with a slight smile. Mary chuckled, clearly amused. Joe, you're quick, she said. From what Clara told you, she found you attractive even when you were out of reach, but now she's seeing you as an option. It's something that can feel very intense, especially under the circumstances. She continued, I'm not here to discourage you from moving on, but I want to help you process your marriage first because how you handle this will affect any future relationship. Got it, I said, understanding her point. Mary gave me a reassuring smile. Let's work through it, Joe. You're taking a healthy first step. Well, as far as I can tell, you had a good, solid marriage, Mary began watching me closely. I loved her. I thought she loved me. We raised our kids together, didn't argue much, and shared a good life. I'm a trial lawyer, so work's demanding, but I always made time for us, especially for intimacy, I said. But before she left, I just finished a long trial, and we'd gone about a month without well, you know. Apparently, she found what she wanted elsewhere, and I didn't even notice. That's on me. So, your youngest went off to college, you were occupied with work, and maybe Shelly felt old or disconnected. That could have been a factor, Mary suggested gently. Maybe, I replied, but she should have come to me. Instead, she ran off and latched onto this, idiot. A thief, no less. Mary leaned in, considering her next question. What if she had told you she felt lost or tempted, or even worse, that she'd given in to temptation? If she felt lost or tempted, I would have done everything I could to help. We could have come to you or found some way to work through it. But if she'd already cheated, that's it, that's the line. I don't cross it. I kept my promises until she walked out. Mary looked thoughtful. That's a pretty hard stance. What if it had been a one-time mistake, maybe while she was drunk? It would depend on what happened while she was drunk, I guess, I admitted. But these are all hypotheticals. She did what she did, and to me, it's unacceptable. Mary nodded. All right, Joe. I'd like to continue this discussion next week. Of course. You're an interesting woman, Mary. Completely unexpected. I look forward to it, I replied, hoping to lighten the mood. She gave a warm smile, and we scheduled our next session. It was already 4 p.m., so I headed home. When I arrived, I found Clara sitting on the porch, reading. We didn't need many words. We just exchanged greetings before spending the next hour and a half together in bed. Afterward, we cooked dinner together, 
fried potatoes, spring onions, minced lamb, and spices. The hot spices brought out all the flavors, filling the kitchen with a delicious aroma. Clara wore shorts but no top, which made it hard for me to focus on cooking. Fine, just a second, she said with a smirk, throwing on a t-shirt. Thanks. Maybe now we can talk, I joked, glancing at her. Maybe, she replied with a wink. So, what's on your mind? Actually, something important, I said. I saw a marriage counselor after the court hearing today. I told her a bit about us, about how intense things have been. She said it might be what she called sexual hypercompatibility, meaning we might be physically obsessed with each other. She thought it could be part of my recovery, but then again, she admitted this kind of thing usually doesn't look like. This, I've wondered about that too, Clara replied thoughtfully. I'm sure of how I feel, but I swear, if you took off your shorts right now, I'd be on my knees in seconds, she admitted with a playful smile. I smiled back, though her tone was serious. I do need to decide about Shelly, the divorce, all of it. Shelly went back to Pittsburgh, not with Connors, apparently, but for work and rent. She seemed to accept that we're done. Sounds like she might be searching for stability, Clara said. But if what we have is real, I'm not giving it up. I know you're still processing everything, but I want this to be something more. I feel the same way. But before making any permanent decisions, I want to get to know you better, I said, trying to put my thoughts into words. In a non-physical way, I mean, Clara chuckled. Sounds like a good plan. So, what would you like to know? She told me about her suburban upbringing, college, and her past relationships. After college, she became a nurse, eventually married a doctor, a gynecologist. I was happy for a while, but he had an affair with someone nearby and wasn't even discreet about it. I confronted him, he apologized, and I tried to save the marriage. But a year later, he cheated again. That was it. Sounds painful, I said sympathetically. It was. After we divorced, he moved his practice to New York, and I haven't seen him since. That was five years ago. Since then, I've had a few short-term relationships. Last year, I had a friend with benefits, but he moved to Thailand, she said with a smirk. I raised an eyebrow. Ever thought about going abroad? No, not really, she replied, laughing. When we met at the gym, it had been almost a month since I'd last been with anyone. Well, now you have me, I said, leaning in to kiss her. I didn't want to interrupt the conversation, but it naturally wound down. Later in bed, we kept talking. Clara asked about my life, and I gave her a fairly complete overview focusing mostly on the years before she came into my life. By the time we finished, we were both feeling a sense of calm. Eventually, we fell asleep, wrapped in each other's arms. I guess both Clara and I needed the rest, because over the next few days, our intense physical connection continued, though it slowed to a more relaxed pace. I saw Mary Stevens again, and she asked how things were progressing with Clara. I told her that while the physical side was still fantastic, it wasn't quite as constant as before. I also mentioned that Clara loved baseball and really knew her stuff. I shared how Clara and I had been talking more about our pasts and how, even though it would take time to really know her, I was eager to try. Mary then steered the conversation back to my marriage. She pointed out that processing everything emotionally would take time. She asked about my feelings toward Dr. Connors, and I realized I hadn't thought much about him lately. But when I did, my feelings could be summed up in three words, drawn and quartered. Mary raised an eyebrow and smiled. I've always liked that phrase, though it's pretty barbaric. That's exactly why it appeals to me right now, I replied with a laugh. It's an appropriate response. Mary gave me a grin. You know, if it weren't for Clara, I might have asked you out on a date. But as it is, I suppose I'll keep things strictly professional. I smiled. I think you already demonstrated that point quite effectively. She laughed. I've always had that talent. But you're a patient, so it's off limits. We wrapped up the session, and I scheduled another appointment in two weeks. Over the following months, I asked Shelley to officially file for divorce. She hired a lawyer, and with no minor children involved, things went smoothly. It took about eight months to finalize. Shelley stayed in Pittsburgh, and we spoke occasionally on the phone. She mentioned that she had started dating again, and when I told her about Clara, she sighed. 
That girl has always wanted you, Joe. I could see it. I feel like such a fool, she said, a note of bitterness in her voice. Meanwhile, Clara moved into my house, and I bought out Shelley's share. Our physical connection settled into a comfortable, steady rhythm. One day, I told Clara I loved her and wanted our relationship to continue but wasn't interested in getting married again. I'd been burned once and wasn't eager to repeat that. Clara was understanding. She didn't have children but had always wanted at least one, so we talked about it seriously. She was 37, and while I approached the subject with a mix of excitement and nerves, she assured me she was ready. Eventually, Clara stopped taking birth control, even though she knew I had some reservations. After that, she practically made love to me until I finally let go of my worries. When Clara announced she was pregnant, I felt a happiness I hadn't anticipated. Somehow, I'd known before she'd even told me. Her pregnancy brought a new joy to our lives, adding a spark that deepened our relationship. A few days after Clara and I tied the knot in the office of a judge I knew well, our daughter, Linda, was born. My kids, both sets of our parents, and close friends were all there. Interestingly, Shelley remarried, too. This time to a pediatrician she met at a convention in Dallas. I genuinely hoped she'd found happiness despite the mistakes and hurt from our past. For a long time, I'd harbored some resentment, but seeing how things had worked out so well for me, it was hard to hold on to much anger. Maybe just a little. As for Connors, I didn't need to do anything. He self-destructed all on his own. Word was, he'd gone bankrupt, lost his medical license, and was now working at a gas station in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Clara and I now have two wonderful children, Linda and Stephen. Stephen named after her father, a great man. Our connection has remained as strong as ever, and I truly believe it always will.